audio feed is not good. Yes, yeah, so we have two of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's bad. Okay. You have to have two mics. Hello. Uh, I think that system is not connected to the main. So one is for uh, camera, one is for. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah. This is a colloquium of Trust Lab. And this is a new initiative at uh, our uh, our institute. And if you're not aware of, please check out. This is extremely exciting. Okay, so today's talk about is, in, as we are talking about trust, we are talking about uh, trusting the software, basically. It's a computer science department. So uh, Professor Tom Enzinger will talk about, you know, software needs watchdogs, means how can we trust it. So let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Enzinger. Uh, he, he is the president of uh, IST Austria, one of the premier institutes of Europe. And uh, he has been leading the institute for 13 years, I suppose. And, uh, and he has done, uh, the key area of research is, is software verification and related areas. Like related means anything related, okay. He has done, worked in biology and synthesis, and I can name a few, has done a lot of uh, uh, fundamental contribution in these fields and uh, have won numerous awards and uh, I don't remember those so sorry I don't have a list okay but I want to tell one anecdote uh, about him and uh, so when I was finished my PhD and uh, I would went to him for interview for postdoc so he said what do you want to do I mean what's what's your plan so I said uh, well I am tired of writing papers means my PhD advisor every six months wanted a paper it's too much uh, activity and little time to think. Uh, so he said, this is lazy talk. So <laughs> it's, I'm paraphrasing, he may have said in much nicer words. Uh, write papers. Okay. So it's a, it's a, I mean, it's not, you're not supposed to think. You think and the write paper at the same time. There's no time to sit and wait around. A good idea comes along and you write. And this is a great lesson I had. And then, yeah, then three years of postdoc, and I tried to operationalize that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, no further ado, uh, I will ask uh, uh, Tom and Zinger to please start. Thanks, Ashutosh. Can you? Uh, yeah, you, can you, you need to wear two mics. I need to get two mics. Okay, <laughs> I've never had this before. Though. Sir. Does this work? <laughs> I, I do. I do what I'm told. <laughs> it's working. Yeah. You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ashutosh, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to give a talk here. Um, yeah. This is actually this is uh, the talk I'm going to give you is a bit of of a big, big bit of motiv motivation and also some first results. It's really about an ESC uh, proposal we have that recently has been funded and will uh, be our one of our main, uh, you know, directions of work for the next few years. And it's it's about runtime verification. So. Sorry, 
I'm, I'm simply rebooting it. It seems so frozen. So this is set up. This is the sort of the, the setup. Um, it's about runtime verification. So I mean, runtime verification means you uh, watch software at runtime and verify it, it against the specification. Now this has been sort of always been sort of the little brother of of, of verification, and uh, it's of course the opposite of static verification where you in advance before you run a piece of software you actually prove that it has certain properties there's some feedback Ah, okay. Okay, let's try again. Now it I hear, do you hear me? Because yes. I hear now a lot of feedback actually. Okay, so online. Uh, means the, the monitor cannot slow down the software. And that means in technical terms, you know, for the, uh, the monitor watches the software as it is running and sees certain events, inputs, outputs, system calls, whatever, and it can do per observation only a bounded number of steps. Okay, so this is the model we're having and actually it turns out it's what Michael Rabin called many, many years ago, real time. You know, his, you, you, can, you, you can Google Rabin real time automata, and it was actually a model where it's basically a, 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 a finite state machine which can do just a bounded number of, of uh, which can do a bounded number of operations per input letter rather than just one. Uh, so this, this, is, this is the online aspect. The second aspect we want our monitors to have is it's really black box monitoring. Um, and that the reason for that is actually a reason of trust. Uh, ideally, you, know, you want the monitor written by somebody comp totally independent of the, of, of, of the software vendor, right? You buy the software from company A, you don't want to give the monitoring contract to company A because then they, you know, they're watching their own software and you can predict what their, their result will be. So you want some other company B to write the monitor, but that has immediate, again, technical consequences, namely the monitoring software can, cannot you know, directly uh, go into the source code and make modifications to the source code. It's simply not available. Uh, but all the monitor sees, again, is a stream of inputs, outputs, system calls, memory calls, 
whatever you know you allow your system to be watched. Uh, so this is this black box aspect. Uh, and uh, so, so the setup is the software runs in some environment, typical, the, 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 you know, the system, the operating system really. In practice, what we are building is really what you could call middleware that makes it, that, that watches certain event streams of the software and provides that to be visible by some monitor and the monitor is basically uh, 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 checking the observation stream against the formal specification. And this is why it's really formal verification in the end, but it's the verification of an observation, of a stream of observations rather than of, uh, of, of, of the, the code itself. Uh, now, in, uh, what the monitor does is it provides information that's usually called the verdict of the monitor, and the verdict is usually also a function over time. Uh, for example, the monitor at some point may, you know, may let the warning flag uh, go on when it sees something that it doesn't like. Um, now, uh, one step beyond monitoring is in the, in the community called enforcement, and this is basically the monitor can directly interfere uh, with the software, and we'll I'll give you some examples of that also later. So why is actually, why is this something which I think will become more and more important in the future? First of all, there's clearly a trend that hardware is becoming more and more parallel, right? It used to be that, you know, Moore's law directly translated into basically a speed up of hardware. Nowadays, Moore's law translates into more and more parallelism. Uh, and it's not only Moore's law. We have many more uh, core processors. We have entire clusters of computers, huge data centers, and so on. There is massive parallelism. And in the past, you know, performance was always more important than uh, correctness. Uh, every sort of, every progress of, uh, in, in the hardware was basically directly, you know, sold based on, you know, it producing better performance. And I think it's really time that once we have more and more parallelism, that some of these extra resources should not be used just for performance, but also for correctness. And not only is it time, it's also going to be too complicated to have everything go into performance because, you know, we all know parallel algorithms are difficult to write. And uh, so, uh, so it's actually many, many of, much of our, of our software doesn't make full use of the hardware parallelism that we have. Uh, so I, I think the future could be more, this is a bit of a provocative picture, but could be more that only part of your hardware is actually used to compute. And the rest of the hardware actually watches the compute part of the hardware, whether it actually does the right thing. And if not, it raises some flags. And the second, the second uh, uh, big mega trend is, hard, besides hardware getting more parallel, is the software is obviously getting more complex. We have now, you know, uh, in many software uh, uh, tasks involve now machine learning components, neural networks, and so on. Uh, much software is connected to some uh, cloud and so on. So there's what I call the static verification gap. That's the, the gap between the, uh, what we can formally verify and the actual software complexity. This is going to only grow. In other words, software complexity is gonna, has in the past and I, I predict will continue to grow faster than our verification capabilities. Uh, and uh, that, of course, makes also makes, uh, you know, static verification. Uh, at least we shouldn't keep all of our bets on, on, on static verification. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, runtime verification, I think, has some advantages that at least I had been, I had underappreciated. So while in static verification, technically, you know, in a, in a very theoretical sense, is about all possible behaviors of a system. Random verification is just about the one behavior you or the monitor is observing. But it can be a very, very long behavior. I mean, we are here talking about reactive systems. The monitor can, 
you know, can watch the system for an arbitrarily long time. Uh, and so the formalisms we need are actually quite different. Uh, but static verification is, is essentially, if it comes down to it, an emptiness question. No matter how you model your system, whether as if I'm an automaton or a time automaton or a, or a push down system, the simplest verification problem is reachability. It's, it's an emptiness question. Uh, it's about all possible runs. Uh, uh, while uh, monitoring is a membership question, you see one particular run of your system, and you, you want to know, does that particular run satisfy your specification? So if your specification is, a, is an automaton, then this is membership. Uh, is it in the language accepted by that automaton? And just, you know, right away here, you should uh, realize that, uh, that the methods you're using, the formalisms you're using, should actually be different. Because much of, uh, much of really static formal verification really tries to, uh, to make an, an emptiness problem decidable in a theoretical sense. Uh, while uh, and while uh, we're here worrying about a membership problem, so we should, we sh it should be very natural to talk about more complicated specification languages than we do in static verification. There's no need to restrict ourselves to finite state methods or temporal logics or anything like that. We can easily build monitors that have counters, that have registers, uh, that are basically Turing complete in a computational sense. And membership is still perfectly decidable, even online decidable. So this is a very big technical change if, if you go from static to random verification. Uh, and other one is that you can actually monitor a system for, for an arbitrarily long time, and in a very technical sense, in an arbitrarily long time, possibility becomes, event becomes actually probability. Uh, it means everything that can happen will eventually happen, but it depends on, your, uh, on, on, on exactly the formal uh, model you, you, you set up, but, uh, uh, but uh, in, in many cases, you can make use of this fact. Uh, and uh, the other thing is if you worry about just uh, the membership about, you know, does one particular trace satisfy specification, it's much easier to use quantitative methods, statistical methods, and approximative methods. And I'll give you an example here uh, is, is actually, uh, you know, we have never managed to really have a satisfactory uh, theory of approximate static verification. Uh, even though it would be very, very desirable to have such, right? You have a system, you have a specification. That, uh, that statement, the system approximately satisfies the specification, right? Because most systems, are, most real systems are actually not really correct, but you still are much more interested in systems that are closer to correct than others. Uh, but there is no, even though many people have, including myself, have worked on this for quite some time, there is, it's very, very, very difficult to come up with a, with, with a useful and at the same time elegant mathematical theory for approximate verification. And the crux of the matter is you have to, in the end, define some distance between systems and specifications where both systems and specifications are the set of all, the set of all possible runs of a system and the set of all possible runs that satisfy the specification. And you have to measure some distance here. You can, of course, do it mathematically, but it, it doesn't really lead to practical methods. Well, in random verification, the problem is already much simpler. You have a single trace, and you want to know how close does it come to satisfy the specification. Uh, it's at least one quantifier fewer, right? You could, for example, measure the distance here to the closest trace that does satisfy the specification. So uh, I think this is a big, a big advantage of runtime verification. Uh, so, uh, and... Uh, this is, I'm, I think I have largely said this, we, to, be, uh, to, to really be acceptable, uh, the, the widespread monitoring of software to become acceptable, it really it must be third party, that means independent black box, it must be unintrusive, so really low overhead, not slow down the system. Uh, and therefore, it also must be actually uh, online and best effort, right? 
if the monitor simply can't come up, uh, uh, can't you know keep up with the system, it will have to just make the best effort, and therefore you know naturally again lead some sort of a, to some sort of approximate result rather than give up completely. Uh, so, so much about the motivation. Let's become uh, uh, a little bit more concrete. In the, uh, so, the, this, the examples I'm going to use basically is uh, when uh, uh, all our traces are going to be over an alphabet of four observations. I call this A, B, T for tick, for clock tick. Uh, so, this, if you wish, this is a very discrete notion of time, but perfectly satisfactory for our purposes here and O for other. So I only care about A, B, and, 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 and tick events. And so I trace this an infinite word over these A's, B's, T's, and, and, and O's. Uh, and a monitor, you know, reads such an infinite trace, and at, after each input letter, does some bounded amount of computation, and then issues an output, the verdict of the monitor. Uh, and suppose we monitor, want to monitor classical properties, the response property that every A is eventually followed by a B. You know, the monitor can do anything really much here. And this has the following technical reasons. Response is actually a liveness property. That means after seeing any finite prefix, uh, so any, any, any finite word over these letters, there's a way to extend uh, that finite word to an infinite word, so to add, you know, a possible future that satisfies the property. Uh, namely, you know, suppose you have had an, you know, an, a pending A, you can simply, you know, add a B uh, and then do only others, right? So after a finite, uh, after seeing a finite prefix, you can never say that the property is violated. But it's also co-life. Cool that means you can never say that the, after a finite word that a property is satisfied either because after every finite prefix there's an infinite possible future where the property is violated. I mean, you just extend by an A and only other. Uh, a and then infinitely often other and that means you're going to violate the property. So a monitor cannot say anything useful here. This is actually a simple response property is already sort of not monitorable. Uh, according, for example, to Pnoel Isaacs or many other such uh, similar definitions, and this actually has been shown that you know, in in uh, in this this, uh, if you worry about Boolean properties, that uh, you cannot basically only monitor a, a Boolean combination of of, of safety, safety properties. So the verdict, in a sense, contains no information. It has to be bottom all the time. It's the only possible verdict here. Uh, now, if we go to quantitative monitoring, the, the picture is much nicer and, and, and more nuanced and, and richer. Uh, so, uh, a quantitative monitor is simply one that doesn't issue a Boolean verdict, not true or false, uh, but, but can give you more information. For example, a number. For example, we want to monitor maximal response time. What does maximal response time mean? I want to monitor the number of the maximal number of ticks between an A and the subsequent B. It can be, you know, a natural number, it can be five, for example, or it could be infinite, right? For example, if an A is never followed by B, or if the response time keeps increasing, then also you, you, you get uh, in, in the limit infinite. So that's what I call a quantitative property, where the output of the monitor is a number, and you can see if we get, for example, this input word, the monitor, uh, here it would see an A and then a tick, so it would go from zero to one because the maximal response time so far has been one, uh, or it's the hypothesis, and then it sees the B, so indeed the one is correct, then there's another A and another A, and then there's now suddenly two ticks, so the monitor should, uh, the verdict of the monitor should be now switched to two, because that's the hypothesis, and if there weren't another tick, it would increase to three and so on. So that would be sort of the, the, the desire, most accurate verdict that a monitor can give for such, an, for, for such a property. And here's actually a simple counter automaton that would produce exactly such a verdict. It would have a counter X, uh, which simply counts the number of ticks since the, uh, since 
the last a that hasn't been followed by b. So with an a you go to the right, with the following b you go back. But, uh, and if you see more a's, you stay in this state. And you know, the number of ticks since the last unresponded a, you count simply in this variable x. And then you keep your verdict v is, is always the maximal, uh, ec maximal x you have seen so far. So you update v always you know, take the maximum between the previous value of v and x, right? So this is a simple automaton which has a counter x and has this other memory register, whatever you can't want to call it, v, which uh, you can update with this max operation that would, do, would produce this, this verdict. And it, obviously, it's not a finite state monitor. Even for such a simple property, you need to go beyond finite state, but there's no reason not to, right? You can. Uh, you, you, you can, of course, uh, uh, implement and run such a monitor. Uh, now, the other thing you see here immediately is sort of there's this sort of ideal verdict, but you can immediately have a notion of a, approximate verdict, right? An approximate verdict could be, for example, your monitor has limited resources. For example, your monitor is finite state, right? And it cannot monitor this exactly, but it can do its best. And it may not, it may never, you know, give you the two here, but it can only say give you the difference between zero and one, right? So then you, you, you get an approximate verdict. Or the verdict could be simply delayed. For example, here I, I showed you the monitor, which, you know, immediately increases the hypothesis from uh, one to two once you see the second tick here. But, you know, it's equally valid to write a monitor that switches to verdict two only when the B actually comes. Uh, that would be, you know, delayed corresponding to the first. So you can now worry about the distances between such verdict functions. So the this, this setup, uh, theoretically, for such quantitative monitoring, you have the alphabet of observation. You have the, the verdict values. We insist, uh, for technical reasons, this to be a complete lattice. So with the top and the bottom, uh, I'll write lambda. The quantitative property, for example, maximal response time, maps each infinite word to a value in lambda. Uh, this is now the difference to a traditional Boolean property. A Boolean property match, maps every infinite word to a Boolean value, to true or false. It either satisfies a spec or it doesn't. Here, we, we can have an arbitrary value, like the maximal response time. Uh, the verdict function is now a function that look, is the out that provides the verdict function is really the monitor, right? It's the output that the monitor provides after every finite prefix of an infinite string it is. So it's a function from a finite words to the value function lambda. Uh, and uh, so some obvious things, quantitative monitoring can be about limits. I can actually, uh, I, I, I will have, this verdict function, and I can define then on limits. For example, to take the soup or the inf or the limb soup of uh, such an infinite sequence of verdict values. And I could, for, and, and not I could, I actually say that the verdict V monitors the property P exactly from below, not approximately, but exactly from below, if the limb soup of my verdict function. So that's really the, the smallest value uh, that, that seen infinitely often in this verdict function is exactly the property value. Then I say this uh, monitor mob, uh, monitors the property. Uh, and quantitative monitoring can, can and should actually be universal. It means I can insist on uh, the monitor to producing the right, uh, for example, the exact uh, verdict function for all possible input words. So there's a for all, in, uh, so the, uh, I, I want that there exists a monitor, namely a verdict function that works for all input words. Uh, and the third thing is it can be approximate, right? For example, I can immediately define an, an, uh, an error of a monitor of a, of a verdict function to be epsilon if for all input words in all positions the difference between the verdict, the, the approximate verdict, and the ideal verdict is bounded by epsilon. 
Now, if I have this set up, I can immediately start worrying about trade-offs, especially trade-offs between the precision of the monitor, you know, is the epsilon big or large, uh, big or small, and, uh, and the number of resources that the monitor has. For example, a monitor that has, you know, is finite state, will have to incur in, on, 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 uh, for some properties a larger epsilon that a monitor that has a counter, which could, for example, be, uh, be for maximal response and be exact. Uh, but also, you know, can, can you monitor more things with two counters than with one? Uh, can you monitor more with, uh, with registers where you cannot just count but do addition multiplication than with counters? This is all, this is all about precision resource trade-offs. Uh, and here is an example of a kind of result that's actually not too difficult to get. So suppose now, um, uh, you know, you have, uh, I have now observation 0 to k, and my property pk is in every finite prefix uh, uh, it contains as many ones as it contains zeros, as many twos, it contains ones, as many threes, as it contains twos, as many fours, it contains threes, and so up to k. Now, obviously, you can monitor this with k counters, or k plus one counters, because you just count this number of zeros, the number of ones, the number of twos, and so on up to k's. Uh, what you can actually prove is you cannot do with less than k counters. So, and I find this example very, even though it's not even so difficult to show this, and certainly it's intuitive that you need k counters to monitor this property, I find this example so nice because it shows that you immediately are in a different world than in our classical world of computability. In classical computability, any function that you can compute with two counters, you, or any function that you can compute with k counters, you can also compute with two counters. Well, this is different here. You cannot monitor with two counters what you can monitor with three counters. And the reason for that is exactly this online argument that you can only do a bounded number of operations. Uh, you would really need some sort of uh, as an operation, uh, much more powerful operation than counting uh, to do this. Uh, you can play on this example even further, like especially in security, this a very interesting property is actually that the, a key never repeats or something that you claim to be a nonce is actually new. That's essentially the following property that you have a sequence of strings, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, all separated say by some separation marker. And your property is that no two of these alphas are the same. Right? That's what it really means to be a nonce. Uh, to do this, actually, you need an unbounded number of registers. You cannot do this with any finite number of registers, and at least with addition and multiplication. You would need much more powerful operations to do this uh, online with, with bounded time count. So, uh, I, sh I showed you maximal response time before. Of course, a very, uh, you might immediately ask, well, uh, suppose I'm not interested in maximal response time, but average response time. I'm interested in the average number of ticks between an A and the next subsequent B. There's various ways to actually define this formally, so you need to actually have a formal specification what you really mean by that. What do you do, for example, if you have two A's followed by a B? You know, do you then count this as two average response times that you, two response times that you average or not? Well, here's an example of, 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 of a monitor for that, but clearly you need for such a monitor more powerful operations than counters, you need in the end some verdict that, that actually divides, and you also actually need additions. I wouldn't know how to do it uh, without that. Interestingly, this, even though it's rather straightforward and easy to write this as a monitor, uh, when we work, we, we didn't work on monitoring. We actually worked on static verification. We tried to, to, uh, to, mo to, to find out statically what's the average response time of, say, a finite state machines over A's, uh, B's, ticks, and, and O's. Uh, and that's actually a non-trivial problem. Uh, and it led us actually to this kind of, uh, of monitoring, in particular to something 
a, a, a different model which we called nested weighted automata, which is, uh, uh, which is basically where you have a master uh, automaton that with every A spawns off a new automaton that simply counts the number of ticks to the next B. Uh, and so there can be, the mass automaton can spawn off any number, any unbounded number of, 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 of such, uh, 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 such counter automata because you know, there can be an unbounded number of A's, an arbitrary number of A's before the first B. Uh, and it turns out, you know, if you have this model, you can monitor uh, average response time, but you can also prove uh, that you can actually solve the emptiness problem not just the membership, but the emptiness problem for such automata. This is exactly how we, you can stat, it's the first algorithm actually that's known to statically check uh, average response time. Actually, this is, these, these, these nested weighted automata are quite related to, to an earlier paper of Prunelli where they called them uh, temporal testers. And they're also obviously a special case of alternating automata because this is some limited form of automaton conjunction. Uh, so uh, this, I, I just show this, but this is, you know, this is results we had for, for the static verification that I just wanted to show you that, you know, if you work in runtime, it can even improve your, your static verification results. That the emptiness of these deterministic nested with automaton, is it still, by the way, an unsolved gap? Is it P space or X space? It's somewhere in between and only for, uh, for special cases do we have. Uh, do we know have exact upper bounds here? But is it, I want to show here one slide how you can uh, go to actually beyond purely discrete systems, say to hybrid systems, cyber physical systems, whatever. Some of you work on timed automata. Also, there the monitoring problem, especially quantitative monitoring, is extremely natural and, and interesting. And there's been almost no work on that. Uh, so instead of now having A's and B's, I have, say, a request signal and a grant signal. So it's very clear what an average um, time, average response time monitor should look like. It should produce the following verdict function, right? Uh, as long as there has been no request, uh, it's zero. Then if you have had a request but no corresponding grant, it, uh, the average response time should increase at slope one, right? Like having a clock, a real-time clock in that case. Uh, when, the when the grant comes, you know, it stays here. So far, it's been, actually in this case, two. And then suppose the next, uh, the next request is granted after one second. Then, you know, here the hypothesis so far would drop to one, right? It would sort of, under the assumption that, you know, the grant follows immediately, but grant follows only one time unit later. Uh, so it reaches one and a half at that time. That means you actually here need a clock of slope a half here. Uh, and then it stays here until you see the next request, right? So you, there's, there's a lot to be done. I, that's the only purpose I'm showing this slide. You won't see any more continuous time here, but there's a lot to be done for continuous time monitoring. Uh, one thing I want to also put in here is the notion of assumptions, because in monitoring, uh, you, in practical situations, you almost always will use assumptions, but they're very natural and fit into this system. So there's really, these trade-offs are really not only between precision and resource use, also between a third thing in which I call the strength of assumptions. What's an assumption? An assumption simply restricts the universe of the possible traces you see. It's some subset. Uh, it, it's really some language over infinite words, right? Assumptions means the trace you're going to see comes from that subset A rather than the set of all possible traces. Now, where a, does a, uh, can an assumption arise? Well, it can arise from knowledge you have about the system. In monitoring, they call it predictive monitoring. You know, you may, for example, uh, know that, you know, uh, a system never uh, produces two A's before it sees a B, right? And that restricts the number of possible traces you can see uh, because you know something about the system. Uh, and that can be used, for, of course, by the monitor. The monitor may need less resources or can be more precise because of such an assumption. 
it can also be an assumption can arise from knowledge about the environment. And here I'll give you an example. For example, then you may know you'll see infinitely many ticks. Time will always advance, right? And that's an assumption you can use. And I'll show, show that to you. Or an assumption can come actually from information about other monitors. Often you don't have you know, one central monitor, but you monitor decentrally many event streams and then you somehow integrate the verdicts of all these monitors. So uh, you know, the verdict from one monitor is an assumption for the other monitor. Uh, so here I can, I'll show you now how you uh, can use assumptions, in particular the assumption that there are infinitely many ticks. So suppose we want to monitor bounded response time. I want to know that every A is followed by a B out within five ticks. This is the property I want to monitor. Now, unlike response, that every A is followed by B eventually, which is not monitorable, bounded response uh, is a little bit better. Why? Because a bounded response is still not, uh, not a liveness property. Uh, because you can extend, uh, suppose, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, you can always, uh, you cannot always make it true. Suppose you see an A that's followed by six ticks, then it's violated, right, no matter what. You cannot extend it to be true. So it's not a liveness property, so it's a little bit more monitorable. Sometimes you can say it's actually violated. Uh, but uh, it's not safe, and, um, uh, and it's, it's co-life. I actually don't need to gain this. The whole point here is uh, that you, you, can only, uh, you can only monitor, uh, you can on, the, the monitor can only give you extra information if it's for sure violated, right? Uh, but, uh, if you have the extra assumption that there are infinitely many ticks, then this property actually becomes suddenly a safety property. Uh, why? Uh, because if it's now violated, uh, then um, if, if, you, if the property that every A is followed by B within five ticks is violated, then it's violated already by a finite prefix. Why? because there's always a long enough finite prefix that will have six ticks. Uh, and uh, so you will see each violation within a finite amount of time. While when you don't have the assumption that there are infinitely many ticks, you may never be able to say uh, 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 that it's actually violated if you simply you know, see an A and then no tick and no B. You can never say anything. Uh, but if you know that there are infinitely many ticks, there will be some prefix. You wait long enough and then you see your six tick and then you know, you know it, 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 uh, it, uh, uh, here it's violated or not. So assumptions help. Here's a totally different kind of assumption and uh, this brings probabilistic assumptions into the picture. Uh, suppose what we monitor, one of we have a finite alphabet, um, uh, sigma as we always call it, and we want to monitor simply the, the mode uh, of the behavior. What, what's the mode? The mode is the most commonly occurring letter. Right? And one easy way to do this is, of course, to uh, simply you know, count each of the letters. And you know, the hypothesis for the mode very naturally would always be the letter that has occurred most often so far. Right? So when, under what assumptions can I say that the limit this monitor will give me the right result? Well, one assumption under which this works is, for example, that these letters are produced by some, Markov, some unknown Markov chain. If it's actually, it has to be also a, a fully connected Markov chain. If this is a fully connected mark, finite Markov chain that produces this output I'm seeing, that I can be sure that this very simple monitor that just counts each letter and uh, always has the hypothesis that the most, uh, the letter that has occurred most often is actually is the mode. Uh, this will actually be, give you the right result with probability one, but only under that underlying assumption. But the interesting thing is there's one more interesting thing here. 
do you actually need as many counters as there are letters? And it turns actually out you, you can do with fewer counters. Uh, I mean, it's, I'll show you how you can do with four counters. I think you can even bring this down to three if you're even cleverer. But it's, it's roughly the fo following idea. Uh, you partition actually the infinite trace you're seeing into longer and longer sub-segments. Okay? And you always you have, a, have a hypothesis, what's the mode so far? You know, what's the most commonly occurring letter so far? And suppose you are here in this segment A5, and you say, for example, A is the letter that has occurred most often so far. So in A5, I now check if B occurs more often than A or not. And in A6, I check if C occurs more often than A or not. And in the next long uh, segment, I check if D occurs more often than A or not. If so, I switch my hypothesis. Suppose C occurs more often than A, I switch the hypothesis to C. Uh, and then I go round robin again through all the letters in the alphabet. And I can do this off, obviously with fewer than number of letters, many counters. I can do in this case with four or possibly even three counters. Uh, and eventually this will nonetheless converge to the right result of the mode. But again, this shows you, for example, gives you immediate sort of results about the, the, the resources you need for monitoring this particular case, the mode. I'll give you now a, 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 a few slides where I give you several other applications of, 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 of monitoring that we've been working on. They all have a little bit more practical flavor now. Uh, but uh, just to show you in how many different contexts you can, can use monitoring. Actually, one context we call differential monitoring. And that's simply, you know, uh, using uh, a program as itself as a specification. So suppose your goal is uh, to produce primes, okay? So you can write a program that produces primes in, say, in the sequence of size, two, three, five, seven, eleven, produces all, generates all the prime numbers, and uses one algorithm to do this. Now, you can check, you can monitor this, of course, against some mathematical definition of what a prime is, right? Uh, what differential monitoring is, is you simply monitor this against another program that totally, is totally independently written and also produces, int the intention is to produce primes. So this can be a totally different program, diff uses different algorithms, is written in a different language and produces also a sequence of time, or at least is the intent to produce a sequence of primes. And the monitor simply compares if, if, if you get the same sequences or not. And this is clearly one way of increasing trust in your system. And that's often useful, actually, because it's often difficult to specify exactly what you want. Uh, and here you're basically checking. Uh, it, it's like having in what you in hardware call redundancy, right? You, you, in airplanes, you often have triple redundant computations and so on, and then there's some voting. And here you have a monitor, you know, check them. It's also what I find interesting. It's a way of, of how, you, how you can think of over-engineering software. I mean, in most engineering fields, you can, you know, make your system safer by, you know, uh, by throwing more effort into it or more material into it, whatever. You suppose you calculate, you know, how much steel do you need in your, in your bridge, your concrete bridge, to hold up a certain load. And then, uh, so you make the calculations, and then to be extra safe, you double the amount of steel, right? This is called over-engineering. You can never make software safer in a traditional sense by just doubling the amount of code. Usually it becomes unsafer if you do such a thing, right? Uh, this is actually a very principled way in which you could conceivably, you know, make the system safer by just doubling, uh, doubling it. Uh, we, especially in machine learning and neural networks, you, there's is a rich playground for monitoring, I think. Uh, this is certainly one avenue that several people have pursued is monitoring or as it's sometimes called shielding a neural network. For example, you know, you 
neural network gives is, is uh, the autopilot that drives your car and you want to make sure it absolutely never leaves the road so you build a formal monitor that overrides the neural network whenever you know the commands of the neural network would leave the road this is called shielding but that is nothing but a monitor right uh, I find actually something else, some other use of monitoring here more intuitive because uh, actually uh, learning is good at short term things. Well, it's, it's, it's traditionally not good at long term planning. Uh, for example, you know, if, if you want to have a robot get from A to B and there are local obstacles, that's actually uh, learning is much better to deal with, you know, getting around the local obstacles than keeping the long-term goal in mind. Uh, so in, in, in the terminology of, of Kahneman that would say, you know, uh, learning is good about short-term, immediate, uh, you know, unconscious decision-making, while symbolic planning is good about long-term, conscious uh, decision-making which is incidentally exactly the opposite of what shielding does, right? Because in shielding you use the formal method to, for the short-term overrides. So I think a much more natural way is actually to use monitors to somehow be the arbiter between a symbolic planner and a neural network, which makes sure that the neural network actually is in command to avoid immediate obstacles and dangers and so on, but at the same time, the symbolic planner gets sort of listened to often enough to actually reach the overarching goal. And there are, there are also some such architectures out there. Here's yet another use of monitors in, uh, in uh, learning in this kind for classification. Suppose you, know, you uh, learn your vision system, you, uh, like how to detect traffic signs. Uh, then what you could, mo you could really use a monitor, for example, even a monitor that sees the internal values that are being propagated through your neural network to figure out whether something is novel or not. Whether, for example, a, a sign is being seen that's never been seen before or that's not in your training set. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we did such experiments basically with some building some abstractions about the monitor watches the values that flow through your neural network and, you know, build some abstractions and see if it's in the box of what you have seen previously. With, a, with a each transition here, the value is in, in the right box and if you see something new, the monitor raises a flag. The user, of course, can then look at the flag and decide whether the system needs to be retrained or not, for example. Uh, here, here's another use. I mean, one, one, uh, one very important problem in learning is that, uh, that your decision-making is fair, right? If you're, if, you, if you're at the bank and use uh, machine learning to decide whether you give somebody a credit or not, you want to make, you know, the, the algorithm should be fair in the sense that it shouldn't depend on whatever attributes of, of, of the person uh, uh, asking for the credit. Uh, you might, for example, not, uh, you shouldn't use, you know, the, the local zip code or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, these things are called algorithmic fairness and that's actually a very natural property to monitor and exactly very natural to monitor it with counters. Uh, so in this case here, you know, just to check a property that's called in this literature demographic parity, uh, when uh, then an output one should be as likely after for an input zero as it is for an input one, you want to basically monitor that ratio if it stays approximately one. And you can have some error tolerance here or some confidence, uh, uh, but it's, it's clearly a monitoring problem and the monitor can raise the flag if, uh, if, if such a fairness is not satisfied. Uh, so I've listed here, uh, sort of, I've, I've given you bits and pieces from a whole number of papers which I've listed here, just if somebody wants to look into that. Uh, I can, uh, where's Ashutosh? Yeah. Should I stop now and simply ask questions or should I show, take another five minutes to show you what?
No, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. So it's what we have, uh, because I'm quite excited about some, something recently, it's again back to the theoretical side. But it's actually now, it's not, uh, monitoring has led us actually now to define what we think are the right generalizations of safety and liveness from qualitative from, to quantitative notions. And um, I just want to show you this. this, this hasn't appeared yet. Uh, but I think it's a very, very, very interesting result. So it's the safety liveness distinction is a, one of the very fundamental distinctions in, in, of, of properties in, in formal verification, right? Uh, it, all, it, it suggests what you can do with certain methods, right? Safety is, uh, is essentially the properties that you can verify by invariance checking or discovering the invariance. Uh, but for liveness, you need some more complicated mechanism, some ranking functions or, or, or something of that matter. Uh, like termination is, is the classical liveness uh, property. Now, there, there is of course a, a, you know, a very celebrated classical definition of, of safety and also of liveness. Uh, and uh, I'm rewriting that definition. That by itself is not a great contribution, but I'm rewriting it to, to make the generalization. I'm rewriting it in terms of a monitor. So uh, basically, a Boolean property is safe if whenever the property is violated by an infinite word, you can detect, or a monitor can detect that violation after some finite after seeing some finite prefix, right? And uh, say this in, in, in a formula, it says for every infinite word w, there exists an, uh, a number of steps i, or a number of observations i, such that if the, the property is violated over the infinite word, uh, then no matter how you extend the prefix of the first i observations, for all possible futures, it's violated. Okay? The monitor knows after i steps it's violated because all possible futures will violate the property. So this is the classical, or it's equivalent to the classical definition of safety, just rephrased as a monitoring. <coughs> and there's a similar definition, similar, there's also a definition of liveness uh, in the monitoring framework. A property is live if no monitor can ever give you, detect a violation. Uh, and that means for all infinite words and for all, no matter how many, uh, 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 no matter how many observations the monitor sees, if the property is violated, the monitor cannot say it's violated because there exists still one possible viol extension in which the property is satisfied. Okay, and this is exactly equivalent to classical definition of liveness, but again, just refers to monitor. <laughs> And of course, what you want to have for your definitions of safety and liveness is that the, probably the most, most, most important theorem about safety and liveness is that every property whatsoever, and I'm talking here not about finite state properties, so every property whatsoever about simply sets of, or a property of infinite words can be decomposed into a safety and a liveness property. It's the intersection of a safety and liveness property that means all these methods that tell you how to verify safety and how to verify liveness is actually complete because you know you can just you have your property you decompose it into safety part and liveness part and if you have a method for for proving safety and for proving liveness you 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 can prove it so now we want to go quantitative and it's actually very natural how you make this now quantitative once you have phrased it like this with a monitor uh, so the monitor the property is now does doesn't give you the value true or false, but gives you a quantitative value, something from your set lambda. Uh, and uh, I want to have a prop, call a property safe, again, if my hypothesis is uh, now that the property value is at least lambda, lowercase lambda, lowercase lambda, some, some value from the, from the set capital lambda, that's my hypothesis. And I want the monitor to, uh, if that property is violated, if P of W is less than lambda, no matter what lambda is, the monitor should detect it after a finite amount of time. So it means for all words, for all values, property values lambda, there exists some finite number of observations. 
such that if the property is violated, if P of W is less than lambda, then after a finite amount of time, after seeing a prefix of I observations, the monitor knows that it's violated. That means the soup now, and I need really here a soup because this could be in, a uh, max is not sufficient, it could be an infinite set of possible extensions. And uh, no matter what the possible extension, the soup of that is still less than lambda. So at that point, the monitor knows at step I that